Mr. Beaton, you've been described at various times, and in fact, you've described yourself, I think, at various times as an author, a designer, uh, a dandy. You may not have called yourself a dandy, but other people have. A painter, a photographer. Now, which of these is your main profession? I wish I knew. I'm afraid that's been my trouble for a very long time. I was very slow in finding a vocation, and I think I took a shot at, uh, in every direction, and I wouldn't say that yet I know which is my real vocation. Uh, which of, the, uh, of these various activities gives you most artistic satisfaction? That I don't know either. All I know is that I don't get stale. By the time I'm through one particular job and I come to another one, I approach it with complete freshness. And I think that's a great advantage. In other words, your pattern of work is, is contrived so as to enable you to switch job from time to time and, 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 uh, and change horses, in fact. Yes, I can't control it, of course. There's an enormous amount of hazard. I mean, a, a whole lot of uh, uh, theatre jobs might come in succession or perhaps uh, writing jobs. I, I can never say, well, I'm going to spend March and April doing one sort of job and then switch. Does photography keep going the whole time? No, there are many months in which I forget about it entirely. And I do that on purpose, because I don't want to get stale at it. I don't ever, I've never had a studio, for instance, um, for the very reason that I don't want to have the responsibility to feel that I've got to clock in and take so many pictures each month. Uh, I want to try and uh, remain an amateur at it in order that I have the amateur's freshness and spontaneity. Are you self-critical about your work? Tremendously. What do you think, is, what, what, what piece of work, stage design, photograph, whatever you will, has given you the most artistic satisfaction that you can recall? I don't think any of them has given me complete satisfaction. I've got the most terrible ear for criticism. If I do something in the way of a decor uh, in the theater, I'm always the person that hears the one woman in the back of the dress circle say, saying she doesn't like blue. Yes, but never mind the woman in the back of the dress circle. What about the still small voice in the back of your mind? Ah, well, I always try to do the very best I can, and that, of course, always uh, falls short of perfection. Uh, what are you trying to do? I mean, have you ever formulated your purpose? Is it to make pretty things? Is it to, to reflect the age you live in? Is it just to entertain people? What are you after? I think I'm after expressing my instinct. I think I want to be creative, and I think that I want to do something that I know um, is going to get somewhere towards my goal. And that goal doesn't really have anything to do with other people. Uh, if there is a claim, I don't listen to it very much. I'm too busy getting on with the next job. And I only wish that I did have a little more satisfaction in the things that I do. So whatever your ultimate artistic purpose is, it's not anything you've yet achieved? No. no. Are you on the whole more interested in ideas or in people? People. Uh, have you been, uh, in, has the course of your life been changed by argument and by reason or on the whole by the contacts you've made and your, and your personal friends? I would say by contact and the visual really guides my life more than anything. I try to uh, develop by intellect but I know that it's really through my eyes that I work. Now, going right back to your childhood, you come of a, a prosperous, upper-middle-class family, so it seems to me, from reading your diaries. Um, were you conscious in your own childhood, before the time when you went to school, when you were a small child, were you conscious of being pretty comfortably off and everything being smooth and easy? I had an idyllically happy childhood. Um, I think I wasn't conscious of everything being well off. Uh, I wasn't conscious until later that perhaps there wasn't as much money there as I would like. But um, 
until I became, until I reached the age of puberty, shall we say, everything couldn't have been happier and uh, more halcyon. I don't know that I've answered your question. Yes, I think you have. At any rate, at that stage, you weren't envious of other people's lives at all. No. Now, who was the great influence in your early childhood? Your mother? Yes. Um, you've written <coughs> very fully about your feelings at that time over your father in, in, your, in your published diaries. Now, you, you've said some uh, very critical things that, you, that, that were your contemporary thoughts about him. Now, wh wh what was it that made it difficult for you to get on with your father? Well, I think it was very difficult for my father to get on with me because he wanted, obviously, to have somebody who was going to be like him. He was a great cricketer, and he wanted me to be interested in the sort of things that he liked. And I found that very difficult. I didn't know why I found it difficult, but intuitively, uh, I went against many of the things that he stood for and liked. We had the theater in common, and as I get older, I realize that in many ways, I'm very much like him. And I respect him a great deal. But it was very difficult to get on with him because we really didn't have any interests. You, you, you write about him with more emotional involvement than that. You, you, I recall, for instance, that uh, you write with disgust of his pipe smoking and so on. You write quite often with personal disgust, which you appeared to feel at that period. I know you don't feel it now, but I'm asking you to try and recreate that and remember how it did seem to you at the time. Well, I can't really explain. Um, there are certain things one likes about people. One can dislike a person for their smell. Uh, I didn't dislike my father for his smell, but the world of the cricket pavilion and the pinken and his rather hearty friends that he brought back to dinner on Sunday, uh, Saturday nights. All that meant nothing to me, the sort of laughter in the billiard room. It was a, a world that I knew nothing of and had a slight antipathy to. Now, did, you, did your mother know about this feeling of yours at the time? Did she sympathize with you? In a vague way, but... Uh, she was too busy getting on with the job of looking after a family. She wasn't able to help you in this particular difficulty anyway? No, no one could help me. It was up to me to find the sort of world that I wanted. Well, now, years and years and years later, you've now dedicated your published diaries to your father, and it's quite obvious that your view of all this has changed. Uh, what's the rationalization that you've made to, 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 to get on good terms with your father at this distance of time? Well, one does change. Uh, I think that maybe having discovered what I was about, having got into the world that I didn't know even was there and enjoyed it, I, I now can see my father uh, in perspective. Before, I was sort of champing. I was too uh, frustrated. I was... Uh, impossible. I was bad-tempered and I was self-conscious. I was altogether most objectionable. And uh, I think when things became a little easier, um, my attitude of mind became a little more lenient. And I certainly have great respect for my father now. When the time came for you to go to school, was this a, a relief or did you find it a burden? Oh, I found it appalling. Always, from the very start. Uh, well, I found it such a waste of time. The school never engaged your interest? Only the extracurriculum activities at school. Which didn't include sport, I think. Uh, not the sort of sport that I liked. Um, were, were you ever bullied? Uh, I would say that I had my share of bullying, not violence. But you don't look back on school days as being a period of persecution, anyway? No, not a bit. Was going to boarding school and having to leave home as a, a special torture? Yes, particular torture. Do you remember it? What, what, what were the feelings you had about that? Well, I was uprooted, I was cold, I was hungry. It was during the First World War and there was very little in the way of uh, rations. 
I remember after a bit I got papillomas on my feet, which means that uh, they were very painful. They were sort of corns produced by undernourishment. But I just felt to begin with that I didn't like that sort of herding together. I hated the stink of the swimming bath in the morning, and um, it took me some time to find one or two congenial uh, friends or uh, people who I realized were hating it as much as I did. Did you find that, uh, you went to Harrow, didn't you, at your public school? Yes. Did you find then that you were in the sort of uh, middle income range of people who were at Harrow, or were you beginning to feel that uh, money was a bit tight by that time? I don't think it really gave me much trouble. I mean, uh, I used to try and sort of slip checks with the headmaster uh, for rather grander pajamas than was supposed to be on the curriculum. And I uh, used to go to the tuck shop and uh, do pretty well there. I wasn't really uh, hard up, no. You uh, did at a certain stage begin to be rather conscious about money, again, judging by what you yourself have written. Was, that, was there a family misfortune? Did your family lose their money, or what happened? Well, I think by degrees. My father um, never really sort of picked up from the 1914 war and he was a, a timber merchant, and things didn't go so well. I imagine Concrete rather put his nose out of joint. And um, instead of sort of facing up to the situation, it was rather a gradual de Grangelard. And it was rather at the back of my mind later, but I never took it very seriously until I came, well, until later, perhaps I'm skipping too far forward. Well, I don't want you to skip past Cambridge, because I want to ask you when you went to Cambridge, where you did, I believe, quite consciously join the then current cult of the Aesthetes. Uh, was that something which uh, was a, a fashionable, if you like, a piece of snobbery that you did because it was the thing to do, or, or did you, did that particular cult represent your view of the artistic world? Oh, no, I did it because it was wonderful, because it was the, the new doors were opening to me. This was something that I'd never known before, and uh, I was thrilled by the fact that certain people would give up their life to uh, aestheticism. I thought it was lots of fun. Did you go in for the rather more bizarre extremities of this cult, dressing in fancy clothes and so on? I think I dressed in a rather peculiar garb, yes. Did you wear a hat indoors as you are this evening? Well, this isn't meant to be indoors. Uh, no, I didn't wear a hat then. Um, and I, why, do you not like this hat? I think it's charming, but I just wondered whether this perhaps dated from that time at Cambridge. No, alas, this, no, uh, this hat I wear because um, I think it has a certain Edwardian bravura. I think its proportions in some way compensate for the uh, deficiencies in my general geometry. And also, uh, it uh, hides the fact that I'm going bald. And I don't like to exhibit myself quite bored, you know. Um, you have, <coughs> various times, written about yourself rather self-consciously, I think, on the subject of personal appearance. This is how it strikes me as a reader. Yes. You, you've used such words of yourself as uh, effeminate, exaggerated clothing, undulating walk. These are all phrases that I've culled from what you've written about yourself. Now, yes. do you think you are or were when you were younger abnormally self-conscious about your appearance? Oh, yes. Are you still so? Luckily, no. Uh, is that the, uh, was it that early self-consciousness which was the reason for your developing a slightly exaggerated and, if you like, bizarre style of dress? No, I think the bizarre style of dress is just a hangover from the past. I think that, uh, I've got rid of the past, except for this hat. By the time you left Cambridge and really had to face up to the problems of the world, did you feel totally confident and successful in anything that you'd done, or were you still insecure? Most insecure. What were your ambitions at that time? To be able to demonstrate that I was not just an ordinary, anonymous person. Um, did you, uh, are there any close friends from either school or Cambridge that you've carried right the way through with you and are still close friends today? Yes. Um, enemies? Yes. No names, I suppose, no pack drill. Uh, I, I don't mind giving a few names. Tell me a few names of friends and enemies who've been with you all the time. 
Well, um, Evelyn Wall uh, is my enemy. Uh, we dislike one another intensely. He thinks that I'm a nasty piece of good. And oh, brother, I feel the same way about him. Uh, my friends, uh, Cyril Connolly was at my first school, St. Cyprian's. And, uh, well, I suppose there were many at Harrow and Cambridge. I won't bore you with them. Who, who are the personal friends, uh, looking back, who've really influenced you at the turning points of your life? Is Connolly one of them, for instance? No, he hasn't influenced me, uh, 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 but I always respected his intelligence. I was amazed when I was at this preparatory school to find how many interests he had outside it, and uh, he was quite a revelation. Um, other influences, I think, have been the Sitfuls, uh, by remote control, Diaghilev enormously, um, Aldous Huxley, in his own way, I think uh, Cocteau, certainly Berard, and um, now we're getting a little nearer home. When you made the decision to go and take photographs, um, was there an awful lot of parental opposition? No, my father thought that it was a pretty rum affair. I mean, he, he felt that he'd given me a good, expensive education, and the only thing that I could come up with, having ruined his account books in his office for about three months, uh, was that I should take a small house in St. James's Square and take photographs on one floor and design sets and costumes for plays on another, and I don't know what to do on the third, but he thought it sounded very vague, and uh, it was a bit of a shock, because he didn't know, I mean, I think 25 years ago, maybe it's 45 years ago, I don't know, um, photographers weren't thought of as being particularly eminent. He didn't think that I was going to be able to get to the top of the ladder in that way. Did he cooperate to the extent of giving you money and so on to help you start? Up to a point, but I think he was pretty exasperated, uh, really. Did, you, uh, did your mother share your confidence in this and help you? She was sorry about the whole situation, but she was rather ineffectual, I'm afraid. She couldn't do much herself, and she didn't want to get unduly worried. Uh, when did you first feel that, that, that you'd turned the corner and you were going to make a success of being a photographer? Well, that happened quite by a fluke, and um, very unexpectedly. I, I, I took these photographs that were considered very revolutionary and fantastic, and um, I had an exhibition of them. And from the moment that the show was on, uh, they just clicked because they were newspaper copy. Uh, there hadn't been photographs of what is known as celebrities uh, photographed in that particular way. That particular way, of course, was, uh, apart from anything else, a very often a very elaborate decor and background, which I would suggest might have distracted attention from the setters themselves very often. I wasn't very interested in the setters ah. themselves. Well, now, what were you interested in? Why did you want to do it? I wanted to make pictures with the camera. I wanted to make something that didn't really look like a photograph. Are you or were you then greatly moved by sheer physical beauty? Yes. You like photographing beautiful women, for yes. instance. Yes. But nonetheless, you found it necessary to photograph them in a highly embellished manner very often. I used to retouch very much more now uh, then yes. than I do now. Uh, why? Because it was part of the feeling of the time. I mean, I created a fantasy. I created a sort of dream world, and uh, in that dream world, you didn't want to see crow's feet and veins in the neck. Um, Obviously, you were much more popular as a, as a photographer, I suppose, because you succeeded in jolly well flattering a great many of the, uh, most of your sitters. A few were rather appalled at the idea of being put under a Victorian glass dome or reflected in the lid of a piano. Do you, do, do, did you think at the time that it was the photographer's job to present the most favorable aspect of the sitter that, uh, that you could? 
I really wanted to please myself. Only to please yourself, yes. Uh, do you think now, looking back on that period of the of the 30s, that your style was a bit gimmicky? I mean, you've changed it quite a bit since then. Oh, obviously, yes. One must. I mean, I, I couldn't go on taking the sort of pictures with any degree of uh, inspiration or vitality. One has to change. One does change, perhaps, without knowing it, but certainly one changes from month to month. Who is the most beautiful woman you've ever photographed? Uh, I suppose Garbo. Is she also one of the influences in your life? Your friendship has been greatly written about and speculated about. As a, as a film star, I think that she was certainly uh, a tremendous uh, uh, event in my life. I used to go to see every picture of hers, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, as soon as the new one came on, and um, I was absolutely fascinated by but her. But that, of course, is a relation that you share with about 410 million other people. I mean, what about more privately? Is she one of the friends who has influenced your life? I think all one's friends influence one's life to a uh, uh, lesser or greater degree. And which would it be in her case, lesser or greater? Greater. Um, tell me, photographing the very famous royalty, uh, Mr. Churchill, people of that kind, uh, do, do you, is it the practice of a photographer at your level to charge these people fees or, or do you merely get rewarded by the press reproduction royalties and so on uh, when the pictures are published afterwards? Oh, well, that depends enormously on the situation. I mean, when I photographed Mr. Churchill, that was done uh, the first time during the war, the bombing of Britain, that was done as a Ministry of Information consignment. And um, uh, the royal family, uh, there's a sort of specified uh, charge uh, for all the photographs. I mean, that's really taken out of my hair. Quite so. Now, when you're just photographing a private sitter, who, uh, first of all, will you, will you take a commission from anybody who comes and says, I want you to photograph my wife or whatever it may be? No, I'm afraid not. You Life is too short. You do it only to please yourself? Uh, well, that sounds very selfish, but there really isn't time to uh, answer the door to continuous knocks. Uh, do you, in fact, charge a sort of <coughs> a fixed fee, as a portrait painter usually does for your work nowadays? Fixed is not the word. You tailor it to the capacity of your client? Yes. <laughs> Good. Uh, why, by the way, uh, am I right in thinking, let me put it this way, that you photographed comparatively few male sitters? I mean, certainly your oh, published... Oh, no, Th no, That's no. not true, is no, it? No, not no. a bit true, no. Do you prefer photographing men to women or the other way around? They're much easier to photograph. Uh, I, I think that I... Pho I think I prefer photographing women, but men are a cinch. Uh, because you're trying to do something different with them, or why are they so much easier? Because I think that one has to have a more lenient approach to women, and to combine the uh, verisimilitude and the sort of honesty of the attack, and at the same time be uh, slightly uh, kind, I think that makes the job a little more difficult. I don't want to go on tiresomely about this point, but, but why a more lenient approach? I mean, if, if you're trying to do something that's of artistic importance, oughtn't it to be warts and all with the women as well as with the men? No, I think that if it were a question of painting, then one would put in the warts. But the camera has a very definite way of exaggerating uh, the deficiencies. I uh, told you earlier that I don't approve of... Uh, retouching, but uh, if you see a perfectly straightforward photograph of a perfectly young and beautiful woman, there are certain things that are objectionable and have to be done away with. It's a sort of politesse. Leaving your professional, leaving your photographic activities now, do you right. on the whole uh, feel uh, a nostalgia for the 20s and 30s? Uh, no. D your world didn't change in, in any disastrous way when the war came? Uh, it changed in a most interesting way. You're not, in other words, an evader and, 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 and as an escaper of change. You're, you embrace it and welcome it. Certainly. Um, ha have you any conscious philosophy of life? Are you a religious man? Uh, 
Yes, but I don't think it would interest you to hear about my particular religious views. But you do live your life according to a, uh, a set of rules of your own, which indeed Certainly. we won't pursue. Yes, but you. Yes. Um, have you now got any important and serious ambition which is still unfulfilled? I mean, you want to go to Mexico City or something, but that's not what I mean. Have you got something in your life which is a big thing which you haven't yet done? And that's a very difficult spot. Um, I think my trouble is that I've been too busy doing the jobs on hand really to think about what I want to be doing in ten years' time. And I've got a very uh, full schedule and I, I really can't think beyond about two years. So, that we've established this, that on the one hand, you have not really achieved satisfaction artistically in your yeah, life, yeah. but on the other hand, there isn't any particular holy grail that you're still pursuing. Oh, I'm still looking for the uh, end of the rainbow. Yes, but you, you can't yet see it mapped out. No, and I think that it may happen quite unexpectedly. Um, supposing you had to judge yourself, in a way perhaps you did have to do this uh, from your diaries when you decided to publish them. Supposing just by looking at the material at your diary, of your diaries, you saw Cecil Beaton there portrayed contemporaneously because you wrote them week by week as time went by. What sort of man do you think you'd find there? Were you a bit shocked when you looked back on the early ones? Um. I really looked upon them from a technical point of view. I came across this hoard and I started reading them and I was appalled by uh, the person that uh, was revealed there. But suddenly uh, uh, there would be a little patch that I thought had great vitality that still seemed to uh, be valid and so I collected them together. Um, and even if I came out of them in a pretty unbecoming light and I thought they were interesting, then I let them go in. I want to ask you a last question now, and to do that I want to quote a sentence from your diaries which has interested me very, very much. I wonder if you can guess what it's going to be. You wrote it one evening in your diary, I wanted to ride bikes and to fight. I often despise people who do these things, but I wanted to be able to do them. Now that was written when you were a youth. Uh, have you ever tested yourself at any stage in that sort of way? In fact, have you ever, at any stage in your life, had to do something which is really too difficult for you? If so, what? Oh, I'm always having to do things which are too difficult for me, and I think that that is the thing that keeps me going. I, I think that I'm not an intellectual at all, but I feel that I need the company of intellectuals so that something may brush off on me from them. Uh, I want to do unpleasant things, because I feel that it's good for my character. I'm a terrific disciplinarian. I mean, again, my father comes into this, although I loathe it, I very often, uh, suffering from the cold as I do, have a cold shower each morning. Uh, I think one of the reasons why I'm here is that it's a challenge. It would be very easy to say, no, I shall just stay at home. But um, all the time I'm trying in my own way to do things that I feel in some way, help a bit. I haven't been able to ride a bike. I went into a holly bush after about the fourth attempt and I thought, well, perhaps it's easier to walk. Occasionally I fight, but uh, I'm perfectly willing to take on any, any, any job that I think may help make me a little better as a human being. Look back in anger next on BBC Knowledge, John Osborne goes face to face.